medical student. Okay. So uh, I'm a fourth year medical student, uh, and today I'll be teaching you guys general disorders of the GI tract. Um, feel free to contact me here. Uh, this is my phone number, and this is my email address. I usually uh, reply to questions and anything you guys have any concerns. So uh, I know you guys are exams uh, soon, so let's not wait any longer and start. So these are the objectives that we'll be covering today. Uh, first, we'll be talking about the overview of intestinal physiology. Then we'll discuss about um, constipation, then motility disorders that lead to diarrhea. So basically diarrhea. And then all throughout, we'll have um, small pop quizzes. Okay, is that good? Uh, and whoever has questions anytime, um, always have the chat open. So feel free to write um, any questions you guys have in the chat and I'll answer inshallah. So let's start. So overview of intestinal physiology. I know you guys, um, so before I started this lecture, I wanted to like make sure you guys understand the basis of like um, overview of intestinal physiology, which I'm sure you guys do, but just let's take a quick, quick recap. So um, obviously we know that the intestine, uh, one of the main functions of the intestine is absorption, right? Um, and the absorption of the intestine actually, uh, it can you guys can divide it into structural. So we have uh, villi and microvilli, brush borders that help us in um, in absorbing the, the the nutrients and everything we need from the, uh, the intestinal lumen. Uh, we also have, sorry guys, just a second. Yeah, uh, we also have transport. Now, transport, it can be either passive transport, uh, facilitated diffusion, active transport, and co-transport, and anti-transport. I'm sure you guys know what it is, but uh, let's just take a quick recap of what it is. So, uh, what is passive transport? Passive transport is basically when small lipophilic molecules such as fatty acids and fat-soluble vitamins can passively diffuse across the um, cell membrane. So it's just, they come and go. Uh, facilitated, so compared to passive, facilitated, they need help basically to move across the, uh, the, the what is it called? The cell membrane. So such as certain water soluble vitamins and minerals, they utilize, uh, they utilize basically carrier proteins that help them uh, transport across the cell membrane down their concentration gradients, okay? Uh, while active transports, uh, basically for active transport, many nutrients such as uh, glucose, amino acids, and uh, even some ions uh, are transported against their concentration gradient via specific uh, proteins powered basically by ATP. Okay, and co and anti-transport, obviously from the name, co-transport is basically together when two um, molecules, uh, they go down uh, the gradient together. So such as sodium transport, sodium dependent glucose transport when sodium and glucose go together or uh, SGLT, which, uh, which is uh, yeah sodium glucose uh, transport. We can also have sodium amino acid co-transporter, which is a sodium and amino acid. I'm sure um, you guys got the point. So anti-transport is basically an exchange mechanism. So anti, they go against each other. So for, for example, uh, sodium hydro, uh, hydrogen uh, exchanger, which is when uh, sodium goes in and hydrogen goes out or basically the other way around. Uh, and basically they exchange. So is that clear so far? Do we move on? Or does anyone have any questions? So whenever anything clear, write clear in the chat so I can move on. Great, okay. So uh, moving on now, um, what do you what do you guys think of intestinal motility? Like, what do you know about intestinal motility? Write in the chat. Okay, Hot base yes, perfect. So hostile segmentation. So uh, just like absorption, motility can also be divided into. Exactly, so segmentation contractions, perfect. So motility can be divided into many different things. First, structure. Uh, so obviously the structure of the intestine help in motility. Uh, and what's the structure of the intestine? Basically the large intestine, they have hostia, uh, which are like basically the shape of uh, an intestine. And what that does is they help move the chyme down. We also have peristalsis. Peristalsis is very, very important in uh, intestinal uh, motility. Why? Because it's basically the primary mechanism responsible for uh, moving food and chyme. Uh, yeah, moving food and chyme. How? It, it does that by 
coordinated contractions and relaxations of smooth mus muscle layers in the intestinal wall. And when that happens, basically it creates like a wave-like movement and that propels the food down the intestine. So that's for peristalsis. Now, segmentation, what segmentation basically is, is that it's similar to peristalsis in the sense that it involves rhythmic contractions and relaxations of specific segments of the intestine. Um, and they basically in the small intestine here uh, that help move the food down. Now, who knows what the difference between peristalsis and segmentation is? You guys can write it in the chat. Okay, so um, peristalsis move foods. Perfect, perfect. You guys are great. So, exactly. So peristalsis is actually for the movement of food. So unlike peristalsis, which mo which moves content in the in one direction, segmentation actually mixes the chyme uh, with digestive enzymes and facilitates absorption by bringing it in contact with the intestinal mucosa. So like you guys said, peristalsis moves the food down while segmentation it mixes it around. Is that clear? Okay, so now uh, we'll be moving on to GI pacemaker cells, which is also very important in intestinal um, motility physiology. Now, what are GI pace pacemaker cells? They're basically ICC cells, which are intestinal cells of Kajal. Okay, and what they do is that they basically generate rhythmic electrical slow waves, which serve as the basis for regulating intestinal um, smooth muscles smooth muscle contractions, okay? So these um, cells, they act like a sensor, basically. They they tell uh, the, the intestines when to contract and when to relax, and they're basically like the brain of the um, intestine, okay? we we However, we do have also a neural regulation, which is here. And what's the um, neural regulation of the intestine is through the enteric nervous system, uh, which basically receives input from extrin extrinsic nerves, such as the vagus nerve, and it integrates um, sensory information from the gastrointestinal tract to, co to coordinate basically motor responses, okay? So the neurons within the enteric nervous system, or the ENS, they release neurotransmitters, such as what? Such as acetyl acetylcholine, such as serotonin, and they basically modulate the smooth, the smooth, uh, the smooth muscle activity, secretion, and blood, uh, blood flow. Exactly. So whoever wrote VIP, that's a very good point. We will be getting into that uh, later. So VIP is basically um, what coordinates all of this. Now, as the last but not least, we also have hormonal regulation, such as what? Motilin, gastrin, CCK, and serotonin. So basically, this was just a quick overview. I want you guys to, to, to keep that at the back of your head. One, now moving on to discussing motility dis disorders. So is everyone um, up to speed or does anyone have questions? What do we move on? So if it's clear, just write clear in the chat. Perfect. Okay. So uh, we'll be uh, we'll be starting with constipation. Now, uh, what's constipation? Feel free to write in the chat. I know it might seem like a dumb question. Why is she asking us what constipation is? Well, because constipation actually has a definition. So a lot of you might think that, oh, constipation is one, like the inability to defecate. Well, yes, that is that, but actually has a clear definition. Hard stool, difficulty in passing stool, exactly. So, but as a specific definition, constipation is actually defined as less than three bowel movements per week, but this is not the required criterion and um, symptoms such uh, may include such as, like you said, uh, straining to defecate, uh, passage of hard stools, sensation of incomplete evacuation, and the need to for self-digitation to evacuate stool. Okay, uh, is that clear? So basically, this is the definition of what constipation is. Now, moving on to epidemiology, okay? So uh, the incidence of uh, constipation in the general population is actually between 2% to 27%. So a lot of people have constipation around the world, obviously. And the ratio of male, uh, female to, ma to male is three to, to one. So females uh, like encounter constipation more than males do. And this is um, basically a lot of the time due to pregnancy and like uh, hormone uh, hormones. Now, uh, moving on to the etiology. Now, from your life experience, I know you, made, you guys made it all the way to first year of medical school. What do you think the most common cause of constipation is? And write it in the chat. 
stress. Okay, that's a good one. Like the most common, common cause, like in your everyday life. Dehydration, perfect. Dehydration. So, uh, exactly. Dehydration is actually one of the main causes of constipation. Well, fast food, fast food's a good one. The Western diet, which is very important I'll, uh, that you brought that up. I'll go into that later. So, uh, the most one of the most common causes of constipation around the world is actually low intake of water or dehydration. Hence, in treatment of constipation, you always, always need to make sure the patient is well hydrated and has good water intake. Now, the etiology of constipation, uh, it can be divided into either primary or secondary causes. Also, it can be acute, uh, divided into acute and chronic. But for the sake of this lecture and what Dr. Abla had emphasized on is primary or secondary um, constipation. So primary constipation is when there is no identifiable, uh, identifiable cause. Like we don't know why. We can't pinpoint. Um, secondary constipation is basically uh, either due to GI causes, neurological causes, metabolic causes, connective tissue disorders, and medications. So we'll be going into each of them. So obviously, by the way, you don't need to memorize these in detail because these are, um, I don't think Dr. had um, like emphasized on them. However, uh, I wanted to bring you guys this for the sake of your guys' further understanding. Okay, so uh, GI causes. Um, GI causes can be such as mechanical obstruction, such as cancer, for example, um, or celiac disease, which we'll be going into that later, actually. Cancer basically causes an obstruction when there's a tumor that's obstructing the whole like lumen. Obviously, stool won't be able to pass. Um, exactly, like colorectal cancer. And we have neurological uh, causes, such as Hirschsprung disease, uh, you guys don't need to know what Hirschsprung disease is. Just know that it can cause neurological, that neurological causes can also be um, cause, cause of constipation. Uh, metabolic causes such as hypothyroidism and diabetes can also cause um, constipation. Connective tissue disorders such as lupus and medications. Medication is actually very important because uh, opioids and analgesics such as NSAIDs can also cause constipation, which are the main side effects. Exactly. And hypercalcemia. Exactly. Like you said, hypercalcemia as a result of many different things can cause constipation. So um, how is constipation, constipation defined? Constipation is actually, for example, you know how we said a person comes to you and you go like, oh, I feel constipated. That's a lot of what people say. But, do you know, like, uh, is this actual constipation or are they just uh, they can't defecate? So as we said, the definition, going back to the definition of constipation, is when there is less than three stool um, movements or bowel movements per week. Now, this is also defined based on certain criteria. And the most common criteria is actually the Rome 4 criteria for, function, uh, for functional constipation. There's also the American College of Gastroenterology definition, the American uh, Gastroenterological Association definition. Don't need to know that, okay? However, uh, when a patient comes to you in the clinic, what will they present with? Well, the most common causes or the most common features, clinical features of constipation are basically staining during, um, straining during defecation, difficulty passing stool, lumpy or hard stool consistency, like one of you guys said, sensation of incomplete evacuation or anorectal obstruction. So basically someone will come to you and they go like, I keep on trying to use the bathroom, keep on trying to use the bathroom. However, the patient, like I can't, I, they basically the patient can't defecate, okay? And abdominal cramping, also keep in mind when the patient uh, is bloated, they can't use the bathroom, obviously they'll have abdominal pain and cramping. And the manual maneuvers to facilitate defecation. Remember when we said here that uh, self-digitation to evacuate uh, stool um, is one of the criteria. Uh, it could happen in some patients where they feel like they can't defecate, so they will basically try to um, release the stool with their finger. Okay, uh, also uh, overall, the description of, of constipation is basically when there's less than three defecations per week. And here's the Rome 4 criteria that I added for you guys. You guys don't need to know this in detail, but know that there are like seven types of different tool consistencies, all the way from constipation, like very severe constipation, uh, which is hard lumps, to like very watery diarrhea. Okay. So does anyone have any questions so far or do we move on? Okay, so I think there aren't any questions, so we'll be moving on to a small pop quiz. Okay, so uh, write the I'll read the I'll read the question now and write the answer in the chat, please. 
So which of the following is false regarding constipation? Is it A, it is defined as less than three bowel movements per week? B, clinical features include straining during defecation, difficulty passing stool, lump or hard stool consistency, and sensation of incomplete evacuation or anal rectal obstruction? C, the most recent criteria is the Rome 5 criteria? Or D, can be due to medication and low water intake? Perfect, it's C, exactly. Thank you guys. So you guys are concentrating. What would the correct answer be? So some one of you said Rome 7. No, actually the correct answer is um, Rome 4, exactly. So if you guys go back, you realize that it's Rome 4 criteria. This is the most recent criteria and this is the most common one out of these used to assess, um, uh, the criteria used to assess constipation. Is that clear? Okay, perfect. So are there any questions regarding constipation? Because now we'll be moving on to diarrhea. Okay, so I don't think there are any questions. So before we move on and talk about diarrhea, so how do we check? okay, perfect, clear. So before we move on and talk about diarrhea, let's talk about the normal flux um, and why we don't have diarrhea all the time, right? So, you know, your everyday life, you don't always obviously always have diarrhea. Now, why is that? Uh, well, your intestine, obviously, are actually made up of um, crypts and villi. So what are the villi uh, responsible for? Right in the chat. I mean, like, it's right there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so... Exactly. Uh, normally, it is an uh, an absorption. We'll go into that. So basically, the villi are responsible for absorption, and the crypts are responsible for secretion. Now, why are we not in um in uh, constant phase of diarrhea? Because there's actually a net absorption. So we absorb more than we secrete. If that makes sense. So see. If you go 2.2 .2 minus 2, obviously it's going to be plus 2, plus 0 0.20, sorry. And we uh, that means we absorb more than we secrete. So obviously if we take in more than we release, we won't have diarrhea. Does that make sense? Because you guys need to under like have this image in mind because I'll bring this image up a lot uh, in, the, in the presentation. So do you guys understand or are there any questions? Perfect. Okay, so now let's talk about diarrhea. Who wants to tell me what diarrhea is? You guys can cheat off the definition, but don't. <laughs> In your words, what's diarrhea? Okay, so um, watery stool and it's more than 200 grams. Perfect, 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 perfect. That's right there. Uh, it's the urge to uh, to to defecate frequently. Exactly. So, as so, all of you guys are correct. As a specific definition of what diarrhea is, it's when there's three uh, when there's diarrhea is basically loose watery stools. Okay, that occur three or more times a day and are more frequent uh, stool passages. That is basically more than normal for an individual. Okay, basically. Uh, someone's normal is different than someone else's normal. What someone, what's diarrhea for someone might not be diarrhea for another person, if that makes sense. However, so it needs to be different than what a person is used to. And it's usually fined as when, uh, when someone, um, when there's basically watery stool for uh, more than three times or three times or more in a day. And for basically uh, typical adults, okay, uh, that have a Western diet. So remember, I think one of you guys said fast food, okay? Fast food does have a huge impact on um, patients, basically, or not patient, a person's um, stool, okay? So, um, so basically, for a person with a typical Western diet, this stool weighs uh, more than 200 um, grams per, uh, per, like, G per D, and it's basically considered diarrheal. So for anyone who has more than 200, it's considered diarrhea. Isn't it when more than 100 of stool isn't passed? I don't understand your question. So when there is more than 200 uh, G per D is passed, that's when it's considered diarrhea. When it's less, um, 
So when we have less tool, obviously that's it's considered it's not considered diarrhea. When we have more stool pass, that's considered diarrhea. Is that clear to whoever asked the question? Okay, so I'll move on if it isn't clear, write your question and I'll answer it, okay? So, uh, but for any, everyone else is, is uh, okay, it's clear, perfect. For everyone else, is it clear so far what the uh, definition of diarrhea is? Because you need it for the understanding of the entire lecture. Okay, perfect. So, um, now that we know what the definition of diarrhea is, let's uh, talk about it in the sense of duration. So we have um, three different types of basically diarrhea based on duration. We have acute, persistent, and chronic. So acute diarrhea is basically diarrhea that lasts um, 14 days or less. So basically two weeks or less, okay? Persistent diarrhea is diarrhea that lasts between 15 days to 30 days, which is between two to four weeks. And chronic diarrhea is basically diarrhea that lasts more than 30 days, and its symptoms can be basically continuous uh, or they can come and go. So basically when someone has diarrhea for more than a month, it's, it's considered chronic diarrhea. Now, remember when we discussed here that basically we're, we don't always have diarrhea because of an absorption. The body absorbs more than it secretes, okay? Now in diarrhea, it's actually different. So we can infer that diarrhea is due to either a problem in absorption or secretion. Um, and so you guys need to keep that in mind when talking about the different types of diarrhea now that we're going to do that in the upcoming slides. Okay, so we will we'll be talking about three different types of diarrhea. We'll be starting with osmotic diarrhea, then we'll talk about secretary diarrhea, uh, and then we'll talk about exudative diarrhea. So is everything clear so far? Does anyone have any questions about um, constipation or definition of diarrhea before we go into diarrhea into detail? So write, write clear in the chat or not. Okay, so uh, since there aren't any questions, we will be moving on to osmotic diarrhea. So what is osmotic diarrhea? Basically, water gets drawn into the lumen because either of poor absorption, remember here when we said that it's basically we're in net absorption. So when, there, when we have less absorption, it will cause diarrhea. So um, water gets drawn into the lumen of the intestine because of poor absorption and either due to ingestion of hydrophilic molecules, such as salts, sugars, and laxatives. So hydrophilic molecules, they will draw the water to them. Obviously hydrophilic, they love water. I don't know if you guys uh, were with me in pre-med, but I taught hydrophilic, like, you know, Phil from Modern Family, hydrophilic, water loving, we all love Phil. So it gets water gets drawn to um, hydrophilic molecules and it stays in the lumen causing diarrhea okay and basically this is uh, this causes alteration in osmotic gradient uh, hence there's more molecules water will get more drawn into the lumen causing all that diarrhea uh, what what could be causes of um, osmotic diarrhea so we can either have osmotic laxatives and laxatives are basically um drugs that uh, that help you guys and help everyone get diarrhea basically and it's usually they're usually uh, treatments of constipation okay such as ma magnesium citrate lactulose and polyethylene glycol you guys don't need to know what okay uh, also malabsorptive disorders such as lactose intolerance fructose intolerance and celiac disease they can also cause osmotic di diarrhea and this is the whole point of the lecture today this is what you guys need to focus on i'll go into more detail uh, detail later on However, I thought it would be a fun fact to include that actually osmotic diarrhea improves with fasting. Why is that? I want one of you uh, guys to answer that in the in the um, chat section right now. Why does osmotic diarrhea improve with fasting? Does anyone know? Okay, feel yourself emphasize on the answer okay so they okay yeah they renew every three to five days you don't have to absorb it as much exactly okay you're right because fasting doesn't cause bowel movement so all of you guys have the right idea but the answer i was looking for is actually because osmotic diarrhea when we eat basically um 
what happens is that let's say we eat sugars, we eat um, salts, all of that. They basically, when they're inside our intestinal lumen, obviously, you know, because of uh, different of osmosis, uh, because of the osmos osmotic gradient, water will get drawn into the lumen because there's food inside that will that will attract the water, that will basically pull the water to it and cause more diarrhea. So when a patient fasts or when a person fasts and doesn't eat, that osmotic gradient, um, it won't be basically towards the uh, lumen, if that makes sense. So there wouldn't be anything in the lumen. So there wouldn't be food, salts, sugars in the lumen that will attract or pull the water. Hence, we, that, we won't have diarrhea. Hence why osmotic diarrhea improves with fasting. Is that clear? So like that's basically the main mechanism. Okay, I think that's clear. So if anyone has any questions, write in the chat, but if it's clear, say clear so I can move on. Okay, so since seeing as there are no questions, I will move on. So now recall that the brush border and uh, the fact uh, and the fact that there are enzymes specific to the brush border. Okay, so wait, is there anything solutes that are in? Yes, so the solutes that are in the chyme cause water to get into the lumen. Yes, so basically going back here. So if we, if the patient has if the patient uh, eats so much, for example, salts or sugars, and there's basically an um, there isn't an equilibrium. So if this basically gets disrupted, if the net absorption gets disrupted, if the, there is more, if there is more, um, basically, let me explain it in a different way. If the net absorption gets disrupted because there's more solutes such as salts and water and everything that, that's basically hydrophilic uh, and, there, and because there's poor absorption, all of these uh, molecules, for example, um, salts, sugars, and every, anything that you eat that has these things, they will pull the water to it, to them, causing diarrhea because of the osmotic gradient. Does that make sense? Who uh, asked me that question? Perfect. Uh, enteropeptidases, I think you are, you're, you're answering this one, correct? Yeah. And you're right, by the way. Okay. So, so we call that in the small intestine, we have something called the brush border. And now what does this brush border have? It has specific enzymes to it. And what are these enzymes? We have, for example, um, lactase, which is a very, very important one. I want you guys to focus on that because we have a whole topic discussing lactase. And uh, we can have uh, sucrase isomaltase, maltase um, glucoamylase. All of these are basically their normal enzymes that are usually always found on the in the brush border. And why do we have them? What do they do? Basically, what they do is they break down oligo and disaccharides. So basically, you can think of them uh, as multiple pieces of sugar, okay? You can say into, into monosaccharides or one piece of sugar, okay? And why do they do that? Because the intestine can only absorb monosaccharides or one piece of sugar, if that makes sense. So if sugars aren't broken down, they won't be able to be absorbed. And then what will happen? Diarrhea. Does that make sense? So we will, okay, let's see. The brush border are in small or large intestine. So the brush border is found mainly in the small intestine. Okay. So, um, so basically that's why, uh, that's the whole point of the enzymes. They basically break down oligo and disaccharides or multiple sugars into monosaccharides or one piece of sugar that can be absorbed. Okay, now let's see exactly how that happens and go into more detail about that in the next slide, which is this one. So let's take lactose, for example. You know how one of the enzymes in the brush border is lactase. Okay, so let's take lactase for its, as an example. Okay, recall in the last slide, as I just said, that lactase is one of the brush border enzymes, correct? Now, lactase, what, it does, what, it, what does lactase do? It's responsible in breaking down lactose so here's basically the action of lactase okay what lactase does is that it breaks down lactose into 
galactose and glucose okay so lactose is a disaccharide or multiple pieces of sugar okay and lactase takes that lactose and breaks it down into galactose and glucose and both galactose and glucose are basically monosaccharides or one piece of sugar why does it do that it's because both uh, galactose and glucose are one piece of sugar or monosaccharides and it's easier for the intestine to basically absorb it okay and um so now let's say uh, we have a lactase deficiency. So a person can have some sort of reasoning of why they have lactase deficiency. So there's this person with lactase deficiency. Deficiency. What will happen? Um, so when there's a disturbance in the brush border and a person has lactase deficiency, the person won't be able to break down lactose into galactose and glucose. And the glucose and galactose will remain as disaccharides or two pieces of sugar, and the intestine won't be able to digest it or absorb it. Sorry, uh, and they will and they will basically stay in the lumen. Okay. However, will it just stay there like that? No. Okay. Why? There's something called osmosis, and due to osmosis, because because galactose and glucose are disaccharides or two pieces of sugar, they can be absorbed. Okay. So due to the the alteration, the osmosis gradient, what will happen is that um whole the because of the lactose and because of the sugar buildup. Okay. What will happen is that water will um pull it. Or water will basically follow. Okay. So you know, because of salts and sugars, basically water follows, okay? And because of the uh, the osmotic osmosis gradient, what happens is uh, water follows and where water follows uh, and goes from an area of, of f with less, basically less concentration to higher concentration, okay? So basically water likes to follow people and, 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 and uh, lactose is basically hydrophilic and it will pull water if it's not broken down. Okay, and what will this cause? It will cause diarrhea. Yes, you're right. So glucose and galactose are monosaccharides. Oh, sorry, I, I, I said disaccharide. I'm so sorry, I meant monosaccharides. So let me recap. Sorry if, if I confused you. I, I meant to say monosaccharides. Okay, so galactose and glucose are monosaccharides. Okay, and when we have lactase deficiency, Lactose won't be able to break down into galactose and glucose, so lactose will build up, which is a disaccharide, uh, and we won't have galactose and glucose, so they won't the, the sugars won't be able to be absorbed. We will have, however, a whole bunch of lactose, and this whole bunch of lactose will draw water into the lumen here, and it will cause diarrhea. Is that, uh, does that make sense? Sorry if I said um, disaccharide, I meant monosaccharide. Does that clear up the confusion? Okay, perfect. Okay, so, um, however, people with lactase deficiency, will they have diarrhea alone? No, okay. They will also have bloating and flatulence. And why is that? It's because of the buildup of lactose, which, uh, which is basically why we have uh, bloating and flatulence, okay? So lactose is a sugar. And what does, and who loves sugar? I want you guys to tell me who loves sugar the most. Obviously in the sense of GI and the guts, okay? Me? Okay, I love sugar. <laughs> I love sugar too, okay? The pancreas, okay, that's not the answer I was looking for, but great thinking and uh, we all love sugar. Bacteria, exactly. Thank you guys, bacteria. Perfect. So who loves sugar the most? Bacteria. Bacteria loves sugar. And when there's a whole lot of sugar buildup, other than the fact that water will be drawn to that sugar and will cause diarrhea, bacteria will go to that sugar. And what will it do? It will ferment it and basically create gas, uh, which will cause bloating and flatulence. So lactose will be broken down into fatty acids, okay? Carbon dioxide uh amino amino acids oh, no amino acids sorry i don't know why i said that and even basically will be broken down to uh hydrocarbons i'm a hydrocarbon so amino acid sorry <laughs> and um hydrogen okay and why uh, is hydrogen important here because hydrogen can also be used to, to test for lactase deficiency so one person has lactase deficiency you know how we just said lactose will um will be uh, attacked by bacteria basically and broken down into hydrogen. We can test that hydrogen through a breath test and measure the amount of hydrogen. If there's high amount of hydrogen, it means that the bacteria 
attack all that lactose, meaning that there was a lot of lactose in the first place, meaning that there's lactase deficiency. Okay. Yes, exactly. Fermentation, colonic fermentation, and breath test. You guys are so smart, mashallah. Okay. So now, what did we all just explain? Basically, we explained something called lactose intolerance. Who are these people? Basically, people who are allergic to milk, you can say. People who can't take dairy, milk, or any any sort of that, uh, anything that has lactose in it, because it will cause them to have lactose intolerance. Now, is what I just explained clear, or are there any more questions? Perfect. So, as I just said, that was lactose intolerance. You have put here a milk bottle for you guys to remember that uh, it's basically called uh, caused by people who who uh, drink milk and they're allergic or they can't because they have lactase deficiency or lactose intolerance. And here I put a toilet for you guys to remember that was called uh, would cause diarrhea. Now we just talked about lactose intolerance, or in other words, we can say dairy or milk allergy. Um, but is milk the only thing people can be allergic to? No. Have you guys ever heard of gluten allergy? I'm sure you guys have heard of it. Okay. So there are people who, yeah, exactly. Celiac disease. Perfect. So people actually, just as people are can be allergic to milk or lactose, uh, lactose intolerance, there are people who can actually be uh, allergic to gluten. Okay. Uh, they can't eat or tolerate anything with wheat rye and barley hence why i put you guys here like a, a wheat or a rye and i put bread and cereal because these people can't eat anything that has these wheat rye or barley in it okay and what did these people have they basically have gluten sensitive enteropathy which we'll get into that later or in other words celiac disease okay so I want to give you guys a small overview of what um, celiac disease is so you guys understand uh, the diarrhea that this causes, okay? Because I feel like I want I want you guys to understand. Obviously, keep in mind that Dr. Abdul Ahad didn't go into much detail, so you guys don't need to memorize what I'm going to explain like in the next slide. However, I thought it would be important to include because if I mentioned it or I explained it, I think it would be easier for you guys to understand, okay? So now we'll be talking about celiac disease or gluten uh, tolerance, okay? Again, keep in mind that you guys don't need to memorize this in detail, okay? So, um, I'm sure a lot of you guys will think, well, why do these people have gluten sensitivity or why do they have um, cilia or why do they have a gluten allergy? Well, uh, I'll tell you now, but first let's give a definition of what celiac disease is, okay? Celiac disease is basically an autoimmune disorder characterized by intestinal hypersensitivity to gluten. Okay, which is basically a grain protein. It is more common in females. So basically, this uh, why am I including this? Because I feel like in some like exams, you guys might see like certain hints um, that can help you guys uh, get the answer. Okay, so it will basically be an autoimmune um, disorder. That's basically the the patient will be mainly a female. Okay, and the patient will either be from eight to twelve months. But however, the most common is uh, when the patient is in the third or fourth decade of life. Okay. Now, this is the etiology or the reasoning why celiac disease happens. However, you don't need to know that. You don't need to know that at all. Like I took this now in fourth year, okay, or third year or whatever. But you, as for you guys as, for, uh, as first, first years, you guys don't need to know that. However, I thought to include it because I'm sure a lot of you guys will be asking like, why do these people have celiac disease? Well, it's basically mainly due to, uh, to genet genetic predisposition due to HLA gene. So when people have um, like something wrong with their genetics will cause um, celiac disease, okay? Now, why, what happens? Basically, these people with this, um, with problems in their genes here, what will, uh, how will this cause to someone having diarrhea and celiac disease? Well, through this pathophysiology, again, you don't need to memorize this. However, I thought I'd include it because I'm sure you guys will have a lot of questions on how these people have gluten sensitivity. So, what you guys need to know out of all of this, okay, is basically um, when a person starts uh, eating, for example, gluten, something with gluten, there's something called tissue trans uh, glutamases. You don't need to know that. They will change a lot of things inside the intestine and they will cause in intestinal inflammation, which causes epithelial damage resulting into villus atrophy, 
crypt hyperplasia and loss of the brush bold, uh, brush border. And this is what, out of everything in the slide, what you guys need to know what I bolded, okay? Um, now, what happens uh, when the person has villous atrophy, crypt hyperplasia, and loss of the brush border? We'll have impaired resorption of nutrients in the small intestine, and this will cause to malabsorption symptoms and diarrhea, okay? Exactly, you can't absorb. Exactly, because if I don't even have the lie, if I don't have the brush border, I won't be able to absorb. So basically, less surface area, hence the less absorption. Am I right? Yes, you're right. Okay. Uh, yeah, so you kind of switched it. It's basically less absorption due to less surface area because of the loss of my, uh, of microvilli, okay? So, um, okay. So here you can see the difference between the normal uh, intestine. So this is the normal intestine. And here, this is basically villus atrophy or someone with celiac disease. And as you can see, the, the, um, the intestines are basically sloughed off and uh, the villi are disrupted and atrophied. And here's where you can see uh, what you would see in a patient with celiac disease or in gluten sensitive enteropathy, okay? What will happen then? Obviously we'll have osmotic diarrhea. Why? Due to loss of the villi, villus atrophy, because of the lack of absorption. So when we have the loss of villi, when we have the loss of the crypt abscesses down here, and when we have complete loss of the brush border, we won't be able to absorb all those nutrients. So what will happen? All these nutrients, they will build up in the intestinal lumen and they will draw water to them. So they basically, they will pull water with them and causing a lot of water and the, uh, water buildup, obviously, which will cause diarrhea, okay? Because of the lack of absor absorption. Hence, it's called uh, osmotic diarrhea. So celiac disease causes osmotic diarrhea. Does that make sense? Are there any questions? Okay, I think, clear guys, is it clear? Or are there any questions? Let's write clear in the chat, if it's clear, so I can move on. Okay, so seeing as there are no, no questions, I think it's clear. So moving on to a summary, okay? So osmotic diarrhea is basically excessive accumulation of osmo, uh, osmo, osmo, I can't speak, osmotically active solutes in the lumen, okay? Now, uh, it can be due to, for example, um, Reduce surface area for absorption, as I just said, and celiac disease, gluten sensitive enteropathy, or it can be ingestion of absorbable, uh, absorbable substances by individuals with absorption defects, such as lactose by lactase deficient patient. So everyone else in the world who doesn't have lactase deficiency, they can, they're healthy individuals who can take in, uh, who can drink milk without having diarrhea. However, um, and obviously, hence why lactose is absorbable, okay? But people with uh, absorption defect have, uh, who have lactase um, deficiency, they will have osmotic diarrhea because of the lactose buildup. Or we can also have ingestion of non-absorbable substances by normal individuals. So this, so the first, the first um, line here, any of us, if any of us take these substances, we will get diarrhea. Why? Because they are non-absorbable. They're meant to draw water, and they can be in the treat. Uh, they can be in the uh, used in the treatment um, for uh, what is it called? Constipation, like some people use for laxatives. Okay, some of them are sorbitol, which is sugarless gum, which um, which basically is hydrophilic and it will pull water. And for example, magnesium, which is an antacid. Okay. Can you repeat why does it cause osmotic diarrhea? Which one? Do you mean celiac disease or lact lactose or lactose intolerance? Yes, celiac. Okay. Why does celiac cause osmotic um, diarrhea? Okay. So let's go here. Okay. So you know how, um, what's basically important for us to know is that we have a brush border in the intestine, right? And this brush border, it helps us absorb all these nutrients and it helps us absorb all these nutrients, okay? So when we absorb all these nutrients, there won't be any nutrients there in the lumen. We absorb them all, okay? However, in celiac disease, what will happen is that there will be destruction to the brush border. So the whole brush border will be absorbed, uh, dis destructed. We will have atrophy of the villus, okay? So the villi atrophy, so we won't have any villi to absorb. 
So the entire brush border, do you see here? So this is the normal intestine, here is in celiac disease. So the entire brush border and the villi are, they're gone, they're destructed, okay? So we won't have anything, uh, and it will basically cause less surface area, and we won't have anything uh, that helps us absorb, okay? So everything that we usually absorb, we won't, and it will stay here in the lumen, okay? When it stays here in the lumen, they will, because of the osmotic gradient, there's way more in the lumen than in the um, than in the uh, cell, okay? What will happen is everything, all of these, um, all of these molecules or whatever that are built up in the lumen, okay? They will pull the water to them, causing diarrhea, okay? So obviously they will pull it in the luminal intestine and where will it go? It will go all the way down to the intestine out of the rectum causing diarrhea. Okay, does that make sense? It's because of a lack of absorption. Why? Due to destruction of the villi and the brush border. Okay. Clear? Clear, perfect. Okay, so uh, this was the summary. Now, is everything regarding osmotic diarrhea clear? Okay, perfect. So this is basically a summary of osmotic diarrhea, as I just said. Now, this is basically, remember this the, this line here, we, uh, in normal people, we have net absorption. Why, this is why we don't have diarrhea. However, in osmotic diarrhea, because of celiac disease, because of um, lactase deficiency, what happens is the secretion is fine. The, you, know, you know how like, we, the secretion is fine, but the problem is with absorption. Because of the lack of the brush border, because of the destruction of the brush border, absorption decreases by more than 20%. See the difference between the normal, which is 2.20, to decrease to more than 20%, which will get 1.76, which will have us into more secretion than absorption, which is completely opposite to what's where the body's used to. And, uh, hence, we will have a net secretion. So we will secrete more than we absorb, causing diarrhea. Is that clear? So is, we just finished osmotic diarrhea. Is everything about osmotic diarrhea clear? Is there any questions about osmotic diarrhea? Write in the chat. If not, write clear so we can move on. Perfect. Okay, thank you guys. Okay, so now we'll have a small pop quiz on osmotic diarrhea. So again, the same thing. I'll read the question. You guys write the answer in the chat and then we'll discuss it. So. What is the main cause of lactase deficiency and gluten sensitive enteropathy? Is it A, loss of the brush border causing an inability for the intestine to secrete? B, loss of the brush border causing an inability of the intestine to absorb? C, lack of osmotic gradient? Or D, equilibrium between blood and intestinal lumen? B, perfect. I'm so proud of you guys. I actually uh, wrote this question to confuse you guys. Well, you guys are so smart, mashallah. So it's actually, this is A and B are similar. However, B says absorb and A says secrete. So in uh, lactate deficiency and gluten-sensitive gluten enteropathy, um, we will have an issue with absorption due to the lack of brush border causing osmotic diarrhea, okay? So the answer is B as you guys can see. So another question is, what happens in celiac disease that leads to osmotic diarrhea? Is it A, sorbitol mal malabsorption, B, lactose deficiency, C, people don't like cereal, or D, villus atrophy, crypt hyperplasia, and loss of uh, the brush border? D, B, B. Okay. So the correct answer is actually D. Okay. Why? Here, let me show you guys the correct answer. Why? Because here, keep in mind, we talked about celiac disease, which is gluten allergy or basically gluten insensitivity okay or yeah sensitivity not lactose okay so first of all it's lactose not even lactase so that's why b would be the wrong answer because lactose deficiency just means you don't eat sugar however lactase deficiency is the enzyme okay so this is why you guys need to focus in exams and the difference between lactose and lactase they're two different things okay lactase is the enzyme lactose is sugar okay uh, but even if it was lactase deficiency, celiac disease is basically due to, um, uh, it causes osmotic diarrhea due to villus atrophy, crypt hyperplasia, and loss of the brush border, causing loss of brush border, uh, inability to absorb, causing um, 
osmotic diarrhea. Is that clear? Okay. Clear, guys, do I move on? Okay, so I think the concept is clear of osmotic diarrhea. So basically, as a recap, what we discussed is constipation, meaning of diarrhea, and we discussed osmotic diarrhea, which uh, can be caused by lactase deficiency or lactose intolerance and celiac disease or gluten uh, sensitive enteropathy. Okay, is that clear? So uh, seeing as there are no questions, we'll be moving on to the second type of diarrhea that we need to discuss today, which is secretary diarrhea. Now, what's secretary diarrhea? It's basically when there is an impaired electrolyte activity, okay? Uh, so there is no disruption to the intestinal mucosa compared to osmotic diarrhea. So osmotic diarrhea, we said that there is a lack or a disruption to the brush border. However, in secretary diarrhea, the intestinal mucosa is normal. So there's no disruption to the intestinal mucosa. However, we will have fluid secretion secreted into the lumen more than um, being absorbed, uh, being that than fluid being absorbed. So we have secretion more than absorption. And why? This is basically because of impaired electrolyte activity. What can be the causes? It could be, for example, bacteria, okay, such as um, cholera, which we'll go into more detail about that later, or E. coli. And it can be due to viruses, such as norovirus, rotavirus, adenovirus, you guys don't need to know those. Or it could also be due to neuroendocrine causes, such as gastronoma or carcinoid syndrome. Again, you guys don't need to know those. Uh, however, we will focus mainly about uh, on um, V. cholera and E. coli, uh, or travelers, traveler's diarrhea, uh, which is what Dr. Um, I had focused on in you guys' lecture. So, um, why does this happen? It's basically there's an increase in cyclic AMP, which we'll discuss later. And compared to osmotic diarrhea, in osmotic diarrhea, we mentioned that there will be uh, that uh, when fasting, basically fasting, improves osmotic diarrhea. Okay. However, in secretary diarrhea, there is no improvement with fasting. Why? Because the issue isn't with os uh, os like the osmotic gradient. The, it's, the issue isn't because when there's um, solids in the lumen, it will basically pull the water, right? The issue is because of secretion. There's more secretion than absorption. Okay, is that clear? Guys, is that clear? Perfect, thank you. Okay, so here's a quick summary of what um, secretary diarrhea is, and we'll go into more detail in that later. So recall how we said in the last slide that secretary diarrhea, uh, that in secretary diarrhea, there will be an imbalance in electrolyte, which is uh, what causes secretion. Well, here is why. Uh, we, there are basically two main reasons. It's the number one, like the reason one is because due to chemical irritation, okay? For example, let's say um, ricinoloic acid, okay, which is found in castor oil. Uh, if, for example, someone uh, ingests that and it stays into the in the lumen, this will basically cause irritation uh, to the to the luminal uh, to the to the epithelial wall of the um, intestine. Okay, and the body will want to get rid of that Be because it's not like the body isn't used to eating that. Obviously, because if that if something causes a chemical irritation, the body will obviously want to get rid of that, right? And how does it do that? One of you actually mentioned the answer way earlier on the lecture, and I said, I'll discuss it later. So here am I discussing it. It's uh, it, How does it get rid of it? It basically gets rid of, uh, of it by something called VIP. Now, what is VIP? VIP is vasoactive intestinal peptide, okay? And it basically acts like a hormone which will allow the release of chloride into the intestinal lumen and water will follow because we obviously know that water always follows chloride. Like we know, water always follows sodium. Okay, so water always follows chloride, hence causing diarrhea. So I know that might be way confusing, but we will go into more detail about that in the next slide, but keep that in mind, okay? So the same happens for bile acids, okay? Bile usually gets absorbed, okay? In this distal small intestine, that's where the bile usually gets absorbed. However, let's say um, that part of the small intestine gets resected in surgery or whatever, okay? Now the bile won't be able to be reabsorbed because obviously we took that area of the intestine where it usually absorbed, so it won't be able to be reabsorbed. 
and it will get secreted instead, which will cause chemical irritation and secretory diarrhea because bile acids, obviously it's an acid, the intestine isn't usually like um used to that. So it will basically cause the chemical irritation causing um secretory diarrhea. Okay, secretary diarrhea can also be uh, caused uh, due to bacterial infections such as E. cholera and E. coli, which we will get into that in more detail um, in uh, like in the lecture now, in the upcoming slides. However, let's start with the first reason of secretary diarrhea, which is chemical irritation. Okay, so we'll talk about chemical irritants now. Uh, we know some chemical irritants that we just talked about, such as re uh, ricinoloic acid, which is found in uh, castor oil, and there's also uh, bile acids and uh, oleic acid. Now, oleic acid is found in olive oil. All of these can cause irritation to the intestine if they're in the lumen, okay? How do they get in the lumen in the first place? Let's say someone ingests it and it will go all the way down to the lumen. Let's say that's how it starts. Now, when these irritants are found in the intestinal lumen, okay, they will obviously come in contact with interchromaffin cells, which are the cells that line um, the intestine, okay? Now, when they come in contact with these interchromaffin cells, they will cause irritation to these cells, obviously, because they're not, these cells aren't used to being in contact with these kind of acids, okay? So these acids, they will irritate the um the uh, interchromaffin cells, hence, hence the name chemical irritants. Chemical because they're acids and irritants because they irritate. So they will these acids will come in contact with the interchromaffin cells or e cell, EC cells, okay, and they will cause irritation. Now, when these interchromaffin cells sense this irritation, they get irritated. They don't want them. They want to get rid of them. They will basically um they will basically secrete or release serotonin here. Uh, 5 uh, 5HT, which is serotonin, okay? What will the serotonin do? Serotonin will go all the way, okay, uh, through the efferent uh, sensory neurons, okay, and they will, which, and will cause the release of VIP, okay? That's one of you mentioned already. This VIP, what will, what will, it, what will it do? Like the simulation of VIP will cause the release of chloride through the CFTR um, receptor, okay? So, and after chloride gets released, who will follow chloride? Water. As we just said, water always follows chloride. So water will follow the chloride causing diarrhea. Hence the name secretary diarrhea. Okay. And this will happen as long as the irritant is there. So if the irritant keeps on irritating the interchromaffin cells, this whole process will recur and it will occur and occur and occur in a cycle until the irritant is gone. Okay. So it will not stop until the irritant is gone. So we'll have diarrhea until the irritant was gone. If the, if the irritant, if we get rid of the oleic acid, if we get rid of all these irritants, the chemical irritants, the diarrhea will stop then. Okay, is that clear? Does anyone have any questions on this? Because this is very important for your guys' exam. So write yes in the chat if it's clear. Okay, so perfect. Thank you, guys. Okay, so moving on. So we already basically explained this, okay? This is basically bile salts and how they can cause uh, chemical irritation and uh, secretary diarrhea. So uh, due to basically the ileal resection or the, the ileum, obviously, is part of the small intestine. And that's where... Um, and that's where bile acids get absorbed. So when, let's say, we resect that area, we take that area away in surgery... Uh, we won't have areas where um, we will be able to absorb the uh, bile acids, which will go down all the way to the large intestine, cause these um, chemical irritants, and repeat this entire process again and cause secretary diarrhea. Other than that, due to the ileal resection, because the ileum is very important, we can also have decreased vitamin B12 absorption. Where is it? Yeah, vitamin B12 absorption and reduced uh, bile salts pool, obviously, because we won't be able to absorb bile salts anymore. And we will have a greater prob probability of gallstones formation and lipid assimilation. Okay, so the entrance of bile salts and fatty acids into the colon induces secretary diarrhea because it acts as a chemical irritant following this 
mechanism, the process. Is that clear? So this is basically we just explained. I'm just re-explained the bile salts and how they cause um how they act as a chemical irritant and cause bacterial diarrhea. Uh, bacterial diarrhea, secretary diarrhea, sorry. So to summarize, to summarize secretary diarrhea. So what happens is basically in secretary diarrhea, okay, what happens is that basically in secretary diarrhea, uh active chloride secretion through this whole process again here. See, all this whole process that will lead to chloride secretion from the CFTR, and it will uh, cause water to follow, causing secretary diarrhea. So chemical irritation, such as long-chain fatty acids, bile salts, they will stimulate um, uh, serotonin release, and then the enteric nervous system will cause uh, VIP to be released, and VIP will act on the CFTR, which will release chloride, and chloride uh, for water will follow chloride, and it will cause secretary diarrhea. Hence, we will have a, the absorption here is normal because obviously the issue isn't with absorption. The absorption is normal. We, we can still absorb. However, we secrete more than we absorb, causing diarrhea. So recall that in, um, where is it called? In osmotic diarrhea, where is it? Osmotic diarrhea, we have, the secretary, the secretion is normal. However, we have decreased ab uh, absorption, hence diarrhea. Here in secretary diarrhea, we have, uh, where's the slide? Okay, we have normal absorption. However, we secrete more than normal. So secretion increases by 20%, as you can see. So compared to two, we have 2.40, which will give us a net secretion. Hence, we secrete more than we absorb, causing diarrhea. Is that clear? So please write clear in the chat if it's clear. So what we just discussed is chemical irritants and how it causes secretary diarrhea. Now, we just said that, um, going back here, perfect, okay, thank you guys. So, um, going back here, so we said that chemical irritation can cause bacteria, uh, can cause, uh, chemical irritation can cause secretary diarrhea, however, bacterial infection can also cause secretary diarrhea, which is what we will discuss now. Uh, so, for for, uh, what was I going to say? For these uh, bacterial infection, ideally, I would have liked to go into more detail because it's actually very interesting and uh, we'll, you guys will face that a lot in the future, Annie, in third, second, and third, and fourth year. Um, however, I don't want to give you guys more information than what the doctor mentioned so as to not confuse you and also to just focus on what you guys need for the exam, hence your exam, because your exam is soon. So I'll on, we'll only focus on what the doctor taught you guys, okay? So we will start with the cholera or Vibrio cholera. Vibrio cholera is a bacteria that can cause secretary diarrhea. How? We will get into that into detail now. Okay, however, fun fact I want to share with you guys is that in exams, when you see some, someone says rice water stool, when it says rice water stool, automatically you guys will think cholera. Okay, it always usually refers to cholera because the characteristic of cholera is watery rice uh, what yeah rice watery stool okay rice water stool hence uh, here i put c bacteria for vicolor and here i put rice for you guys to remember that rice water stool is always vicolor okay let's see you guys questions increase cyc cyclic mp oh i thought it was questions oh <laughs> okay no yeah but thank you for answering that it means you're concentrating which is so good okay so this is fun fact. I brought these pictures to, to help you guys visualize so you guys will never forget. Okay. These are both for cholera. So the left image here shows the characteristic rice water stool. Oh, well, not true for rice water stool. The second you see rice water stool, you know it's going to be cholera. Okay. So this characteristic for cholera. And the right here, you see cholera cots. And this basically happens in epidemics where people sit on those. And um, here you can see the whole for diarrhea, and it's basically set up during epidemics to care for multiple people at once. And people usually here, when they sit on these, they usually lose five to seven liters of fluid per day, which is obviously a lot, okay? So this is just a fun fact about color that I wanted to share. Uh, yeah, and then before moving on. So here, I want you guys to focus with me because this is very, very, very important. And this will definitely come in your exam, okay, on um, B. cholera and how basically 
the, the physiology behind how it causes diarrhea. Okay, are you guys focused? Thumbs up if you guys are focused. Say, say I'm focused. Perfect. Okay. So, um, great. Thank you, Razan. Okay. Okay. Let's make focus. Okay. So, cholera, okay, is a bacteria. What does this bacteria release? It releases a toxin. Okay. Now, this cholera toxin it affects both the absorptive villus cell and the crypt secretory cell. How? Let's start with here first, the absorptive cell. Okay, it basically, cholera toxin inhibits, as you can see, a minus sign, it inhibits the chloride co uh, the sodium chloride co-transporter. Okay, so sodium chloride co-transporter basically takes both sodium and chloride into the cell. Okay, however, cholera toxin inhibits this. So we won't be able to take either chloride or sodium inside the cell. And obviously, they will accumulate in the lumen. And we obviously know water follows both sodium and chloride, okay? So when uh, sodium chloride gets, um, are inhibited from going to the cell and they basically accumulate in the lumen, water will follow causing what? Secretary diarrhea, okay? Is that clear? So we talked about the villus ad absorptive cell and how uh, cholera toxin affects that. So cholera toxin doesn't only inhibit the sodium chloride co-transporter, it also increases or stimulates chloride release from secretary um, from the secretary crypts. Now, how does it do that? It does that by increasing cyclic AMP, which we will go into more detail in this slide. Okay. So oh, there is a, okay. So this is basically cholera. This is a bacteria. What does this bacteria release? Vibrio cholera. It releases cholera toxin. Okay. Here, uh, this is the cholera toxin, which is A and B. Okay. The green and the purple. This is the cholera toxin. The cholera toxin binds to GM1 receptor, which is found on the intestinal cell. So here, this is the intestinal cell. Okay. GM1 is a receptor found on the intestinal cell. And what binds to that cholera? So cholera toxin binds to the GM1 receptor found in the intestines. Then it gets taken in through endocytosis. Now we're inside the cell and the process begins uh, that causes diarrhea. What is this process? It's basically, it causes an increase in cyclic AMP. Keep that in mind. Cholera causes increase in cyclic AMP which then activates the CFTR uh, receptor, okay, responsible for the release of chloride, and uh, chloride will get released, and then uh, it will get secreted into the lumen, leading water to follow, causing diarrhea here, okay? Keep in mind that the cholera toxin binds irreversibly, so once it's bound, it will always be there. Now, does this mean we will always have cholera? infection no why because as one of you actually mentioned at the beginning which was very smart um is that the the cell regenerates every three to six days so the only way for us to get rid of this cholera toxin because it binds irre uh, irreversibly is through uh cell shedding so when the cell sheds it will get rid of this um this uh cholera toxin which is bound to the receptor uh and this ha naturally happens every three to six days now, is this clear? I know this was maybe a lot, but this is very important. And if you guys have any questions regarding this, uh, the cholera, please ask me to repeat and I would be more than happy to do so. But you guys need to understand this. Okay. You always say crystal. Do you mean like crystal clear? I like the fact that you say crystal. Okay. Anywho, so um, moving on. So, <laughs> crystal clear okay perfect so um okay i don't know why this slide is here but I love okay so now that we discussed uh the cholera which causes secretary uh, diarrhea through what through cyclic amp always remember that okay now we'll be moving on to e coli which causes traveler's diarrhea Hence, I put plain for you guys to remember that E. coli, which is this bacteria, causes traveler's diarrhea. Okay. Uh, why is this slide not showing? 
Oh, okay, it's showed now. Perfect. Okay. So trial a traveler's diarrhea is called traveler's diarrhea because it occurs when people get an equali infection when traveling. Where are the places that they travel to that they can get uh, E. coli? They can go to places such as um, Africa, South, Central, and even West Asia. These are the places where ETC or travelers di ETEC or travelers diarrhea is mainly found in. Okay, so travelers diarrhea is also called ETEC or enterotoxigenic E. coli. Now, why does it do that? It's because um, it's basically an enterotoxin. So E. coli releases an enterotoxin. Uh, goes through all the pathway that we'll describe now and explain now that causes secretary diarrhea, okay? And it's called traveler's diarrhea because they get it when they're traveling. So now, the most common toxin that causes traveler's diarrhea, as I just mentioned, is the enterotoxigenic E. coli, okay? Or enterotoxin, um, also known as ETEC. So whenever you see ETEC, they mean enterotoxigenic E. coli, okay? So... This um, E. coli releases the enterotoxin, okay? The enterotoxin goes uh, all the way down into the enterocyte and it binds to something called the GC cell, okay? Now the GC, uh, the GC, not GC cell, sorry, GC receptor. Now the GC receptor will stimulate the release of cyclic GMP, okay? GMP, not CMP, uh, not AMP, okay? So cyclic GMP, will then go on and act on CFTR just like it did in uh, in cholera, and the CFTR will release chloride, okay? Not only that, but we will have, uh, we can also have a goblet cell that releases guanolin, which binds to this uh, GC receptor and induces the same process, okay? Uh, let's see your question. Yes, guanolin cyclase, exactly, GC receptor, guanolin, uh, guanolin cyclase receptor. Okay, so now I this is what you guys need to focus on. So in E. coli, the enterotoxin binds to the GC or the guanoline receptor, uh, cyclase receptor, and it causes the release of cyclic GMP. Okay, and then this will cause the stimulation of um, the release of uh, chloride through the CFTR receptor and water will follow chloride causing secretary diarrhea. Compared to cholera, which binds to GM1 receptors and releases cyclic AMP, okay, which will then move on to the same process by uh, activating the CFTR receptor, releasing chloride, water follows, and causes diarrhea. So they have they both have the similar outcome, the same outcome with chloride release and water following. However, in E. coli, what's the difference is the, the receptor that it binds to, because in E. coli, it's the GC receptor and activates like GMP, while in cholera, it activates cyclic AMP through the GM1 receptor. Uh, well, yeah, cholera, okay? Does that make sense? So the main difference is cyclic GMP and cyclic AMP. Yes, the main difference is cyclic GMP and cyclic AMP um, and the different receptors they bind to. This means we will have both increase in secretion and decrease in absorption all at once. So basically, um, this is mainly secretion. This uh, E. coli and cholera mainly um, uh, cause an increase in secretion. Okay, now, guys, just give me one second. I'm so sorry. Sorry, guys, I'm in the library and the people are coming to get their things. Okay, so going back to um, the difference between cholera and E. coli is that E. coli acts on cyclic uh, GMP and uh, uh, cholera acts on cyclic AMP. And to answer your question is that this basically is mainly secretary diarrhea. Obviously, it affects shoy absorption, but it mainly increases secretion because it releases chloride uh, from the CFTR receptor, okay? Um, so what the difference from here uh, compared to um, cholera, from E. coli to cholera, like you said, cyclic GMP, the difference between cyclic AMP and cyclic GMP, and the receptor it binds to, and the fact that the enterotoxin in E. coli doesn't bind um, to, uh, it doesn't bind permanently, 
uh, to the receptor like cholera. Remember how cholera we said it binds irreversibly, and the only way that it would uh, we can get rid of it is through cell shedding every three to six days. That's for cholera. Now in E. coli, it binds. It does not bind permanently. Okay, it binds transiently. Uh, as for the cholera uh, and the e, e, uh, e. coli, they both act on the CF CFTR uh, receptor, and they will both release uh, chloride. And they will um, and water will follow both of them. And yeah, that's the difference. Irrelevant, but doesn't uh, does it affect pH? Uh, because of the secretion of water, you mean? Thank you. Because of the secretion of water or because of the chloride? I think you mean because of chloride. It will definitely cause um uh what is it called? It will definitely cause uh, imbalance in electrolytes. However, I don't think it will it could definitely make it, I think, maybe more acidic because of all the different um all the different uh like for example hydrogen and all of the different uh ions, but I don't think it will have a huge effect on um what is it called, pH. I'm not really sure how though. Like I can and I can make sure and um answer you later. But Dr. Abdullah didn't mention that, so I didn't mention it. However, I can make sure it will definitely have an effect, but I don't know the exact effect. I'll make sure and I get back to you later. Is that okay? Okay. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, guys. So I made a small mnemonic. I don't know if it will help you. To remember the difference between E. coli and polar, let's say you're sitting in an exam and you don't know which one is cyclic AMP, uh, AMP and which one is cyclic GMP. So in cholera, it's cyclic G, uh, it's cyclic GMP. Okay, so you can think of E. coli as jump. Okay, I thought that would help. So GMP, which is GMP, can also think of it as jump, which is the same like pronunciation. Okay. And why why would you think of jump? Because traveler's diarrhea, you're jumping from one place to another. So GMP, jump, okay? And cholera, uh, cyclic AMP uh, camp. So it stays, stays in one place. Like you, you'd be stuck on that, um, uh, on that place with rice watery uh, uh, diarrhea on the cholera cots. E. coli is a, <laughs> e. coli is a cool guy that jumps. Exactly. That's a cool, that different way than the monarch, yeah. I thought mainly of travel for you guys to connect it with traveler's area, but that's a cool way to remember. It. Good job. Okay. Now, um, I don't know why some of the slides aren't really showing, but uh, yeah, it's fine. So, uh, treatment. So, so obviously, you guys are going to be future doctors, and when you see someone with. Uh, Severe diarrhea, like severe, severe diarrhea. Uh, what's the first thing that comes into your mind that you will be worried about and want to fix immediately? Yes. De yes, exactly. You want to fix the dehydration immediately. Okay. And how would you do that? And how would you treat immediately? What would you, what would the, the first thing that you'll do? Exactly fluid volume. Okay. The first thing you're worried about as a physician when a patient comes with severe diarrhea is dehydration, okay? And the first thing you want to do immediately is rehydration, okay? And how will you do that? Uh, obviously, I gave you here hints through the images, through the IV fluid and the water. So you will do that basically by oral rehydration solution, okay? And um, I'll go into that more detail now on oral rehydration solution, but do any of you have any questions on cholera and E. coli before I move on to the treatment? Isn't oral should be by mouth? Yes, drink water. Oh, but I, you're asking why I put IV? It's because uh, I need, this is just an image to get you guys thinking about um, rehydration. I need now. No, 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 this is just, uh, I just put it for you guys to think in, uh, uh, to think about rehydration. And also, Yanni, yes, you get them to oral uh, rehydration. However, Yanni, obviously, when a patient comes to you in the hospital, obviously, you're going to insert an IV line too, you know? It's the first thing, Yanni. Every time, it's not time you're from your own experience. Whenever you guys go to the hospital, the first thing they do is insert an IV line, okay? So, uh, yes, uh, both of these, Caudra and uh, E. coli, are mainly treated by oral re rehydration solution. However, um, you also want to keep um, the fluid 
in the blood, if that makes sense. Uh, but for, as for the, this lecture, focus mainly on oral rehydration and solution, which we will talk about now. Okay, so what's good is that if you recall in the villus absorptive cells, okay, here, in the villus absorptive cell, cholera inhibits NaCl. Okay, it inhibits uh it inhibits uh the sodium chloride co-transporter, okay, which causes which is what causes diarrhea. However, it does not inhibit the sodium glucose co-transporter, nor does it inhibit the sodium amino acid co-transporter. Okay, the green or brown circles, they don't get inhibited. Okay, why is this good? Well, this is good because when giving oral rehydration salts, water would be able to be taken in. You know, it will still be able to be taken in, even though this is inhibited. It will water will still be able to be taken in, um, as it doesn't follow the same mechanism as what causes diarrhea. Okay, hence when you give an oral rehydration therapy with sodium glucose and amino acids, water will follow that into the cell, making the patient uh be able to get rehydrated. Does that make sense? This is also an important concept. So if you have any questions on that, let me know. Is it clear? Okay, you didn't get it. Okay, so uh, no, recall how we said that in um, in cholera, cholera. How does cholera cause diarrhea? It, because in the villus ab absorptive cells, it causes diarrhea by inhibiting here the minus sign inhibits the uh, sodium chloride co-transport, right? Okay, and if you get what I'm saying right, right, Ashan, I can follow up with you. Okay, so. Cholera, it inhibits, it causes diarrhea by inhibiting the chloride sodium co-transporter causing diarrhea, okay? Here. Now, the cell, however, doesn't only have this one mechanism of getting sodium in, okay? Uh, it also has different mechanisms of getting sodium in the cell, such as sodium glucose co-transporter and sodium amino acid. A co transporter, and we know that water always follows sodium. Color, however, only inhibits the sodium chloride co transporter. Okay, it doesn't inhibit sodium glucose co transporter, nor does it inhibit sodium amino acids co transporter. So, the way it causes diarrhea is by in inhibiting sodium chloride co transporter, causing more uh, sodium chloride to uh, accumulate in the lumen. Water will follow, we always remember, water always follows chloride and sodium. Okay, we'll follow chloride and sodium causing diarrhea. However, for rehydration, it basically works on the ones that a cholera doesn't affect, such as chloride, uh, such as sodium glucose co-transporter and sodium amino acid co-transporter. Okay, so when taken, uh, taking water orally, okay, and sodium and or um, yeah, when or taking oral rehydration salts, okay. Sodium and glucose and sodium and amino acid, they will still be able to get transported in the cell. And what follows sodium, glucose, and amino acids? Water. Okay. So this is basically teaching you the mechanism of why you can still um, give patients oral rehydration therapy through um, through uh, this uh, the oral rehydration salts, which are sodium, glucose, and amino acids and why the patient will be rehydrated because uh because these uh these co-transporters are still viable and cholera doesn't affect them meaning they will still be able to take water in the cell making the patient rehydrated does that make sense hopefully okay perfect that's so good okay so uh now that this is clear i'm assuming inshallah if any of you have any questions ask me anytime um we will move on so this is basically the slide i by the way i got a lot of the slides from dr abdul ahad's slides because i want to explain on them exactly and how he uh how like any you know, the images he brought and also because a lot of them are self-explanatory so yeah um, so this uh, big picture here in the top right basically um, shows you that the cyclic AMP does not have an effect or the cholera basically, cholera, you know how it increases cyclic AMP, the cyclic AMP does not have an effect on the sodium glucose co-transporter, okay, 
nor does it have an effect on the sodium amino acid co-transporter. Uh, hence, it allows the water to be taken in when, given, when giving re or, uh, rehydration oral uh, salts. Okay, so basically this explains the same as the slide. Okay, is everything clear so far? Say clear if it's clear. And if there are any questions, don't hesitate to ask me anytime. What's CT? Where's CT? Oh, CT, cholera toxin. Cholera toxin. Okay. Perfect, perfect. Crystal clear. Any questions? This is very, very, very important for your exam. All the concepts that we just talked about regarding cholera and E. coli. Okay, so if it's clear, now we'll be moving on to a small pop quiz. Okay. What is the mechanism by which chemical irritants and cholera induce E. coli? And wait, wait, I'm going to re repeat the question. Okay. I don't know why I said E. coli. What is the mechanism by which chemical irritants and cholera induce diarrhea? Keep in mind here it says cholera. Okay. Is it A, uh, EC cells or enterochromaffin cells? Okay. Uh, they cause irritation and then serotonin release, VIP release, increased chloride secretion through CFTR, secretary diarrhea, or or uh, B, through cyclic GMP, or C, goblet cell irritation causes uh, a, a serotonin release, VIP, increase in chloride, uh, in, in chloride secretion through CFTR, or none of the above. Keep in mind, I said cholera. So I will answer all your questions, but let me answer this first. So the answer is actually A. Okay. I want I want you guys, so you guys actually answered all of them. One of you said A, one of you said B, one of you said C, one of you said D. So the answer is actually A. Why? Because um okay, because I mentioned cholera. Okay, cholera. Incl increases cyclic AMP, okay? Uh, yes, what did I say? Okay, chemical irritants and cholera, okay? Ch cholera increases cyclic AMP and chemical irritants, they release serotonin. So basically this is, this answer is basically goes all the way back to, um, where is it? To this, this is basically the answer. Chemical irritants and, e and, uh, and cholera and whatever, uh, all of them, they irritate. Okay, and they will cause uh, interchromophone cells to, re to release, um, it's a trick question, it is a trick question. Uh, it releases serotonin, which will uh, enhance, uh, increase VIP and act on the CFTR and increase chloride, okay? So why, okay, let's go back and answer all your questions. So this, why is it not B? Because I mentioned caldera. What increases cyclic GMP is E. coli, okay? Why is it not C? Because I mentioned goblet cells. And goblet cells are not the ones that get irritated. They get irritated. Uh, what gets irritated is the enterochromophin cells, okay? None of the above, obviously, is the wrong answer. I just, I didn't want to include also a really long answer for you guys to get confused. But obviously, it's one of the answers here. So the correct answer is enterochromophin cells. They get irritated. Keep in mind, it's enterochromophin cells, not goblet cells. Why is it not goblet cells? You guys might think, oh yeah, I saw goblet cells before. Where do you guys see goblet cells? You guys saw goblet cells in E. coli. See here, this is go goblet cells when they release guanolin and they act on the GC cells to release cyclic GMP. Okay, this is where you guys saw goblet cells. Okay. As for, oh, okay. As for EC cells, it's enterochromophin cells, not goblet cells, and they release serotonin. So obviously, five uh, HT is the same as serotonin, and then this will cause VIP release, and it will increase chloride secretion through the CFTR, and it will cause um, uh, secretary diarrhea. So this is basically this. Okay, is that clear? Does anyone have any questions? It's very important for you guys to understand this concept. Crystal clear, clear, perfect, 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 perfect. Perfect. Okay, mashallah, you guys are doing really good, by the way. Okay, we have a second question. 
This is a simpler question. Okay, which of the following state the difference between cholera and ATEC or intertoxic toxigenic E. coli? Is it A, cholera is cyclic GMP and, uh, and ETEC or E. coli has cyclic AMP? B, cholera uh, uses cyclic AMP while E. coli, intertoxigenic E. coli uses cyclic GMP? C, cholera uses, uh, both of them use cyclic AMP or D, both of them use cyclic GMP or E, Cholera has bloody stool and E. coli has a uh, rice water stool. Perfect. I'm so proud of you, all of you guys guessing all of them correct. So the answer is actually B. Okay. Why? Because remember when we said uh, cyclic GMP jump and you jump from one country to another. So it means traveling diarrhea. Okay. So E. coli or intertoxigenic um, E. coli or traveler's diarrhea is cyclic GMP, okay? And cholera, it's cyclic AMP. You're, you're camping, you're staying on that cholera cot, you're not moving, okay? Because you have diarrhea, okay? Um, and yeah, and so this explains the first four options. So cholera actually doesn't have bloody stool, it has rice water stool, which is the characteristic of cholera okay is that clear do we move on perfect perfect okay camp is camps because it binds irreversible perfect that's actually so smart i did not think of that so your colleague here said you guys can think of a mnemonic okay that camp is CAMPS. Okay, so cyclic AMP also uh, stands for CAMP, or you can read it as CAMP, and CAMP is like TP. You stay in one place, and since cyclic, uh, since cholera binds to uh, the GM1 receptor irreversibly, so you're camping there, you're irreversibly binding to it. So that's a really good mnemonic. I like that. So good job. So do we move on? Okay, yes. So last but not least, we will be moving on to exudative diarrhea. Now, what's exudative diarrhea? Exudative diarrhea is uh, basically what's exudate in the first place. Exudate is fluid leakage from capillaries during inflammation. Okay, so what's the characteristic or the basically most important thing in exudative diarrhea? It's inflammation, okay? So when does this happen? It happens when there is epithelial injury, okay, and inflammation. However, compared to secretary diarrhea, remember secretary diarrhea does not have any epithelial injury, okay? Uh, compared to osmotic diarrhea, obviously, osmotic diarrhea, we have epithelial injury because of the brush border. At secretary diarrhea, we don't have injury. And here we have epithelial injury and inflammation, hence the exudate, okay? So exudative diarrhea, epithelium is injured and inflamed, causing um, causing exudate to release and hence the name exudative diarrhea because of inflammation or inflammatory cells. And we'll go into that later. Uh, and the most common cause of exudative diarrhea is bacterial infection caused by C. difficile, okay, Clostridium difficile. And we'll go into that later, uh, like now. But first, you guys need to understand that um, we, in our body, we have normal microbiota. Correct. So this is the normal bacteria, our best friends, the bacteria that live in the uh, normal gut. OK, they don't hurt us. It's a basically mutual relationship between us and them. So uh, you can say it's a mutual relationship. We give them shelter and they give us protection. Why is there importance uh, in our uh, normal flora or normal microbiota? Microbiota. OK, so the normal microbiota actually um is lives in close proximity as you can see here lives in close proximity into the epithelial lining layer and it helps protects us against uh, other pathogens and all of that okay so it's a good relationship between us and them however what happens when it gets disrupted so now we know that the gut has normal flora and normal mi microbiota right now can anyone name any of the bacteria that um, that are in the on their guts normally, so that form the normal microbiota. Can anyone any name any of them? 
So bacteria and the normal flora. Just one of them. If you guys know. I'm sure you guys know because this is very important and the doctor mentioned it. But if you don't, that's fine. We'll learn it now. Okay, so I will answer for you guys since uh, none of you guys wrote anything in the chat. So one of the bacteria that's actually part of the normal gut flora is actually C. difficile. Okay, so some of you actually right now might be very surprised um, to hear that because I'm sure uh, many of you associate uh, C. difficile uh, with a bad connotation, like, oh, C. diff causes, causes diarrhea, you know? It's normal? Yeah. See, I'm sure you guys would be surprised. C. difficile is actually, um, like, everyone <laughs> right now has a small, small, like, amount of C. difficile in the, in the, in the, in the normal flora of our gut. It's actually part of our normal flora. However, that's why I said, I'm sure a lot of you guys have um, a, a, like a bad connotation of on, on C. difficile because it does cause a, a huge severe diarrhea. Now, how does that, uh, how does that happen? How does that, uh, how does C. difficile cause bacteria? We will get into that later. Um, but for now, I want you guys to know that C. difficile is actually part of our normal flora. Okay, now how can it cause a C. diff infection? How can it cause a, a C. difficile infection? If there's too much of it, if there's too much of it, it will cause a C. difficile infection, cause diarrhea. Okay, now how does that happen? By antibiotics, believe it or not, by certain antibiotics. Okay, I'm sure that you guys have heard that certain antibiotics have diarrhea as a side effect, right? Now, why or how does certain antibiotics have bacteria the side effect? Well, these antibiotics, obviously, they're called antibiotics, so they kill bacteria, right? These antibiotics, when someone has an infection, they don't, they, they, so they take an antibiotic. So they don't only kill the bad bacteria, they also attack and kill the normal flora or the good bacteria in our gut, okay? So they also kill part of our normal flora and part of our normal microbiota, causing there to be too much C. difficile in the end. So if they kill the back, bad bacteria, they'll also kill some of the good bacteria. What will um, what will get, um, let's say, what will get so much produced of it and uh, take over the entire gut? C. diff, right? Because C. diff is there. However, if you kill the rest of the bacteria, what will conquer and be the majority? C. diff, okay? Let's see your guys' questions. Why don't they call like Accutane? <laughs> like Accutane? Yeah, sure, like Accutane, if you want to think of it like that, okay? So um, why don't they kill C. diff? They do kill C. diff, okay? They do kill C. diff. However, they they don't, how am I saying? Because there's so much of the C. diff, there's so much C. difficile that they kill the rest, okay? And then the bacteria, uh, the patient stops taking antibiotics or whatever. Uh, they do kill all different kinds of bacteria. However, you know, there's some certain antibiotics against specific kind because, okay, let me explain. So we have a lot of different kinds of bacteria in our gut, okay? And certain antibacteria, uh, uh, antibiotics are focused to kill certain uh, bacteria and not the rest, okay? So some do kill C. diff, but, but the, the majority or the antibacterials or antibiotics that cause C. difficile infections, they, they mainly kill the other bacteria and they don't really focus on killing C. diff, okay? So when uh, the other bacteria gets killed, even part of our good microbiota, okay, what happens is C. difficile will flourish, okay? They will go like, oh, this is, uh, there's more room for me, okay? So they will produce, 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 and they will flourish, okay? So there will be production of so much C. difficile, okay? Sorry, but how C. difficile? So this type of diarrhea is because of antibiotic intake. The like there's many different causes of C. difficile infection, but one of the main causes of C. difficile infection is because of antibiotics. Okay. Now, um, this is what happens. So because if a patient takes antibiotics, they will kill other bacteria, and C. difficile will flourish. By the way, it's not all types of antibiotics. By the way, <laughs> it's specific types of antibiotics that are known to cause C. difficile. Okay, such as ceftriaxone or clindamycin. Okay, you guys don't need to know the names of the antibiotics just yet. Wait a couple more years, okay? But just know that some antibiotics um, kill other bacteria 
um, they don't focus that much on C. difficile, and then C. difficile will have more room to flourish and grow, causing an infection. So you know how it says, uh, like the best, like it's always it's always good to have a balance. Okay, it's always good to have a balance of anything in life. Okay, so when there's too much of something that cause that that's something bad. Okay, so in our normal microbiota, we always have like a good balance of of C. difficile doesn't cause us any harm. You know, it's part of our normal microbiota. However, when when it gets too much, then that's bad and it causes an infection, okay? And it causes oxidative, uh, exid I can't even speak, oxidative diarrhea. Now, how does it happen is because of the so much production of C. difficile and it will happen like a disruption of the normal microbiota, we will have C. difficile colonization. What will happen is that the C. difficile, they will attack their uh, the enterocytes, okay? Once the C. difficile attacks enterocytes or the um, bacteria uh, or the intestinal cells, what happens is that the WB uh, B, uh, BC cells, the white blood cells in the blood, will get released. See, the neutrophils and the monocytes, they will get released, okay? Uh, as And obviously, they're inflammatory cells. So they will get released, such as neutrophils and, ma mass, uh, and monocytes, they will get released, um, and they will fight the infection, Okay. And then they will cause an inflammation, obviously, because they're inflammatory cells. Hence the name exudative diarrhea. What's exudative diarrhea? It's basically, again, what's exudate? It's basically the, the release of inf uh, inflammatory um, cells. Like I said, remember here, when I said the definition of exudate is fluid leakage, uh, leakage uh, from capillaries during inflammation. So here, all of these neutrophils and monocytes, they will get released to fight this bacteria or the C. difficile colonization because it's too much, okay? And it will cause an inflammation. Now, is that clear up till now before I move on? I'll move on. If you guys have any questions, I can explain, okay? So, you know how we said C. difficile? Yes, clear, perfect. You know how we said that C. difficile, uh, you know, when there's too much of it, it will cause um, exudative diarrhea because it will cause an infection, okay? So um, once we have an infection of C. difficile, okay, you see the C. difficile, it will destroy the enterocytes. You see how here the enterocytes, all of these enterocytes, they're destroyed. What will happen is that neutrophils and monocytes, they will get released to help fight the infection here. And you see that it will, they will fight the C. difficile cells and it will cause inflammation to occur. And you see the inflammation will increase and increase and increase until you know, it tries to kill the cells. And do you see how thick the inflammation gets? So basically all of this, all this color, this is all inflammation. So inflammation can get up to three to five centimeters, if I'm not mistaken, I got that from Dr. Abdullahad. Okay, and when it gets this severe, uh, like when so much inflammation occurs, it will get this severe inflammation. It forms somewhat of a pseudo membrane. It's like a membrane. It's like a whole. It's called pseudo membrane because it's a fake membrane. Obviously, it happens because of inflammation. Okay, but do you see how it covers the entire um, epithelial lining? Hence the name pseudo membrane. Okay, and what will this cause, or what's the other name of this? It's pseudo membranous colitis. Okay, why is it colitis? Colitis because it's an inflammation of the intestine colitis itis itis is inflammation and colite like obviously then the colon okay so it's an inflammation of the intestine and pseudomembranous why because it forms pseudomembrane so c difficile infection causes pseudomembranous colitis okay because of the inflammation um yeah so does that is that clear up till now Okay, this is very, very important. So I need you guys to say if it's clear or not. And if not, ask me the question, I'll answer it. Okay, so that, and some of you said it's clear. So um, now what happens when we have a pseudomembranous colitis or a C. difficile infection that causes pseudomembranous colitis? Can you repeat the pseudo part? What causes the pseudomembrane? Okay, I'll repeat. Good that you guys asked. So now that we have C. difficile colonization, keep in mind this is not the normal amount. Like there's so much C. difficile that it causes an infection. It will irritate and it will cause, it will like disrupt the whole 
um, what is it called? It will destroy the whole enterocytes, okay? When it gets into the enterocytes and it kills them and it destroys them, what happens is inflammation will happen, obviously. And what will happen is that the blood here, see the blood vessel, the blood will release neutrophils and monocytes, okay, to attack this bacteria. This amount of release of um, monocytes and neutrophils, this is called inflammation, right? Inflammatory cells. These are monocytes and neutrophils and inflammatory cells, right? They kill bacteria, okay? So this will cause inflammation to, 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 to bundle around the, the, la the layer of the cells because that's where the E. coli are because they try to kill them. So the more and more neutrophils and uh, monocytes get released, the more inflammatory cells will 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 huddle around the um the cells okay causing pseudomembrane now what is a pseudomembrane i think one of you guys asked what is a pseudomembrane yeah so a pseudomembrane is basically a bunch of inflammation so it's basically inflammation it's a bunch of inflammatory cells that um that are around the uh, the enterocytes why because they're trying to kill the um the what is it called this the 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 seed episode okay now um some of you said can you yeah can you repeat the seed episode part so that's this is basically what happens hence the name pseudomembrane so it's called it's it's why is it called pseudomembrane because it forms like a like a layer its own layer of inflammation and obviously it's pseudo because it's a fake layer it's obviously not normal for us to have that hence the name pseudomembrane which is a whole layer of inflammation that surrounds these enterocytes uh, that are surrounded by these uh, by the C deficit, and it causes um, uh, yeah, and this is all caused by C deficit infection. Okay, hence when C deficit infection gets so severe to the point where it causes exudative diarrhea, we will have something called pseudomembrane membranous colitis. Why? Because of the name. So C deficit C deficit causes pseudomembranous colitis. Always think of that. Okay, so what's the number one cause of pseudomembranous colitis? It's C. deficit. Okay, why? Because obviously the name pseudomembranous colitis, pseudomembranous because of the pseudomembrane that happens through the inflammation. Okay, and colitis because it causes an inflammation in the intestine, and that's it. So is that clear to those who ask the question? Meral? Yes. Um, I'm going to interrupt. Uh, there are like uh, only three to four minutes left to this session. Do you think you need longer? No, no. This is my last slide. Okay, great. Okay, so perfect. That's clear. Okay, so uh, this is basically the mechanism of uh, C. deficit. Okay. Now, sometimes treating the C. deficit itself doesn't solve the issue, okay? Does the pseudomembranous disrupt the, the, uh, the villi and the crypts? It can, yes, see, it can disrupt it because it, it disrupts the whole enterocyte, okay? So the answer to that is yes. Okay, but you might be asking, oh, it doesn't cause, for example, um, osmotic diarrhea? No, because, because of the inflammation here. The inflammation causes... Like the whole reason it's called it causes exudative diarrhea because of the inflammation. Okay, so now to the treatment. Sometimes treating the C. difficile uh, infection itself doesn't solve the issue. Okay, so remember when uh, we said that this is mainly caused due to antibiotics. So when the antibiotics kill the normal flora, so when we give more antibiotics, we're not treating it because why are we giving more antibiotics? That's to something that's even that's caused from my from antibiotics in the first place. Okay. So in some patients that have severe form of pseudomembranous colitis caused by C. difficile infection, we might need to actually give them a fecal microbiota transplant, okay, where we take the normal microbiota from a healthy individual and plant it in a patient, uh, in the patient which helps restore the normal healthy microbiota, okay? Is that clear? Perfect, perfect. So, and that summarizes what we, uh, the gastrointestinal disorders. So thank you guys so much for listening. Don't hesitate to ask any questions. Again, my name, I'll send uh, this lecture to the, um, to the BLCs and they will send it to you guys. Of course, of course. Thank you guys so much. Uh, you can email me, uh, text me on WhatsApp to ask me any questions. But before you guys go, 
scan this code, please, for Pal. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate it, of course. If you guys have any questions regarding this lecture or any other lecture in that matter of GI or anything,